I got I got to save the country once again. My work is never done. So, a couple things, a couple announcements really quick. That was just a dummy bell. All right, everybody, a couple announcements really quick. First off, after I got three announcements. Number one, you have homework. You have to read 273 to 296 for Thursday. 273 to 296 in America. But as luck would have it, I'm not going to be here on Thursday. You're on the list. You're supposed to at least act like you're, you're supposed to. Oh. I was about to say, you bring in energy to the class. An energy that we miss. So what we're going to do is bring really good shoes. to be nothing but fitness. What I've told the sub to do is just take you. Yeah, fitness. Basically, we're going to go outside and dig trenches. Yeah. And you're going to dig trenches around the school. We'll turn that eventually into a moat. Oh, I thought we were going to go to war in the trenches. Hmm? Well, we might. Who had the alligators? Someone said they had alligators. Let's so bring those in tomorrow. Thursday. I will, yeah, bring your alligators. Yes. Just you two, the field trip. Uh, well, Andre trip. Where are you going? Uh, you know, if you're gonna make up a store, have to have it ready to go. No, we're going to house stuff. We're going to like three different machine shops. It's for welding machines. If, if you don't want to dig, you say it. You're afraid like, to dig a trench. Just say it. Say, I'm afraid to dig a trench. Great store. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'm not going to be here. We're going to, so I'm, I'm going off to do save the country. But, but I'm going to not be here. You're going to watch a movie. Home movies of my child. And so it was just going to be exciting just growing up in Mile City. And now you guys, I, I can see you're excited, right? Oh, and speaking of that, we now have an A. I, I said I could not control fourth period anymore. You guys are completely and totally out of control. You agree? Yeah. Yeah. So Catherine is here. It's now it's my aide, and she is in charge. And she will run the class. Good enough. Nope, she's just here because she didn't, she went out, out of her fourth period class. They didn't dig enough trenches. So she will supply the shelves. And so we have the reading assignment. All right, we're going to go, um, remember, set up to the video. The video is going to be on Thomas Jefferson. I really like it. It's on, it's by Ken Burns. And it's a great video. It, well, it covers his whole life, but I'm basically going to start it where we quit on Wednesday. And we'll start that. And... I'm not sure who our sub will be. Someone. I'm pretty sure it's going to be someone. I hope. Has anyone had to do the class where they had to go into the cafeteria and sit? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm hoping. Now, I know. There's such a shortage of subs. How do you get more subs? Okay, back to your question. Wait. Let's wait. All right. So, let's go ahead and get to, where did we finish here? What, what amendment did we finish on? So we got the fourth, so we did get to no un unreasonable search and seizures. We're filming this class, everybody. That's unusual, I know. So everyone say hi to your television audience. Well, that was enthusiastic. So we have this already. We have this. Is that right? Did I mention rates of assistance yesterday? Did I mention writs of assistance? No. Did we mention Fourth Amendment at all? Yes. So, the British were doing what's called writs of assistance. Now, I made this print really small so you have to squint. Writ, a writ of assistance is a blanket search warrant. So they can search anything they want. That was basically a warrant to search for smugglers. And so, 
a lot of these are from English common law, but it has a direct causation from the Revolutionary War. Now, I think I mentioned this in class, unreasonable, define unreasonable. You see the gray area. So there's lots of gray areas. And hold. The Fifth Amendment is one of the most important. Now, there's three big things about the Fifth Amendment we have to get. The Fifth Amendment, and it's actually kind of hard to read. We're not going to worry about the grand jury. I should add, in times of war, throw this all out. Interruption, throw it out. But three things. Are you ready? The first one, twice put in jeopardy. This is called double jeopardy. You can't be tried for the same crime twice. So let's say you're tried for bank robbery. Why not, right? They, and you're, you're acquitted. They say, well, we'll find another jury and try you again. They can't try you again and again for the same crime. But I should add, there's lots of laws. So they just won't charge you with one law. They'll charge you with 20 laws. Trust me, you broke something. They'll figure it out. So there's ways around that. The next one. Shall be compelled in any criminal case to be witness against themselves. You don't have to testify against yourself in a trial. Because in a trial, if you testify and you lie, that's breaking the law. So you're not going to be put in that position to lie or tell the truth or force a testify. So if you ever see in a movie or a television show and they say, I take the fifth, that means you're not going to testify against themselves. You could plead the fifth, not the fifth. It could be either one. And then you can say, I'm taking the fifth, I'm pleading the fifth. And the last one, this is the most important. Every, now it says person, but this comes to mean citizen, gets due process of the law. So whatever the law may, may entail. So for example, if you're accused of a crime, you must be charged, you must know your rights, you cannot be held without having a charge. You must be indicted if you're going to go to a trial. You must have a trial. There must be a jury. The point is due process. Every single person gets due process of the law, a.k.a. citizen. It's a gray area for people who are not citizens, but that's what it meant. This is the biggie. And that concept of if you're arrested, you have to know what your charge is and have a trial. You're not just in prison. It's called habeas corpus. So that's habeas corpus. So, you, so unless it's a time of insurrection, you can't just be held. So you're not, if you're arrested right now, they have a limited time they can hold you until they formally charge you with something. Yes? What do you mean by insurrection? Oh, like a rebellion, like Shay's Rebellion. Or a rebellion like the Civil War. So there's people within the United States are rebelling against the government. Because they figure if there's a time of rebellion, we don't have time to go through the trial process. Would that be abused? Uh, of course. But that's actually a really good question. But the claim is we're in the middle of a rebellion. We have to stop the rebellion. And so during the Civil War, they're going to hold thousands of people without trial. Just hold. They're not, POW is actually a legal term, which means a prisoner of war has certain rights with the idea we treat our POWs well. They'll, if, if we treat POWs from another country well, they'll treat our POWs well. So that's actually a legal term. So it's more of a detainee or just a prisoner. Next, Amendment 6, speedy trial, speedy and public trial, and counsel. But it was unclear what counsel meant. The Supreme Court would finally rule on what's called the Gideon versus Wainwright decision in the 1960s. But even then, every state has different rules. So this is still not clear. And could anyone define the word speedy for me? Uh, it doesn't take three days. Speedy's relative, isn't it? I would argue it means speedy and speedy a year until you get a trial. Is it two years? It really depends. There could be trials that were very long, 
And if you know anything about the court system today, you might be charged with a crime and died it and not have a trial for a year and a half because it's so crowded. And so it's relative. The point is there are exceptions. Amendment 7, it's a very important, but basically, we're not even worried about this. Civil cases like lawsuits, there can be a jury trial. Civil cases, jury trial. Except for very small ones. They don't have to have a jury trial, but they can have a jury trial. So criminal cases, jury trial, civil cases, jury trial. Now, Amendment 8 is another one of those, hmm, no excessive bail or cruel and unusual punishments. Can anyone, can anyone define cruel and unusual punishment? I mean, I bet we all can describe that. For those of us who have not spent hard time in prison, raise your hand if you have not spent hard time. See, I'm the only one who has. What do you do? Hard time. House friends. How do you do? No one's ever guilty in prison. That's rule one of prison. Was it out I actually have never been in prison. I know that shocks you. Is my credibility gone now? For me? If you've never been in prison, I would bet every single part of prison would seem to cruel and unusual to me. Solitary confinement is pretty darn cruel, but that happens all the time. So the definition varies. And then we're not even twos. The death penalty? How is that not cruel and unusual? And then they say some forms of death are cruel and unusual and some forms aren't. Now, I'm not even saying whether or not they're good or not. Do you see why it's complex? See why it's complex? So why in the state of Montana do they say that lethal injection is, is not cruel and unusual, yet hanging is? Or why not impaling somebody on a stick? How about drawing and quartered? Why isn't that used? Why not stoning people? Questions? Yes. Well, isn't it said that with lethal injection, uh, the aim, like, aim is a lot more of a possibility to fail, so they just strangle to death? You know about lethal injection? That was all the time. Sometimes about think you're off a medicine, that's not kill them. Yeah. So the point is, it's hard to define. The Ninth Amendment is really, it's hard to read. The enumeration of the Constitution and certain rights should not be construed to deny or discourage others retained by the people. Okay. What it means is this, the people have rights, even if they're not enumerated. People have rights that are not enumerated. So they don't have, people are not just limited to whatever's in the Bill of Rights. They have rights that are not enumerated. So the Ninth Amendment, Remember I told you about the Second Amendment and Heller versus D.C. basically said that people now have a right to some weapons? In that ruling, they said the Ninth Amendment says that too. And that makes sense because it doesn't necessarily say people can have weapons in the Constitution. That makes more sense in a way than the Second Amendment, the Ninth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is very similar. The power is not delegated to the United States, meaning the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, by the Constitution, are prohibited to the states. States can't print money, are reserved to the states. So states that don't, don't a power that's, that doesn't go to the federal government, goes to the state. What's the plan power? The enumerated powers. That we talked a lot in class. We must move on. Hmm? Yeah. And so, with that, these are the powers that are listed. That is federalism. That is saying the states have certain power, you know, the federal government has power, the states have power. And so that is the, uh, the Bill of Rights. But don't forget the necessary and proper clause. Remember, it's also called the elastic clause. It's also called implied powers. That gives more power to the federal government, so that makes this kind of, you know, gray area. Now, I add one more thing that's really important. It's really important. This was written. Bill of Rights. Great. It's in the Constitution. At first, it only applied. That's what we have to get. It only applied to the federal government. 
only the federal government. Everyone got that? It did not apply to the states. That meant that New York could do a, a religious test for office, which they did for years. Had to be a, had to be a Protestant, Protestant Christian. The Bill of Rights did not apply to the federal or to the states, only to the federal government until second part, the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment. So you see all these rights and people say, oh, the Bill of Rights. No, it was not clear that the Constitution even applied to the states until the 14th Amendment. Everyone got down on the 14th Amendment? That is the most important part of the United States Constitution is the 14th Amendment. It was done in 1867. Everything that you think of as rights, everything, in fact, that you think of meaning the rights and liberties of the United States actually come about after the Civil War. This did not yet apply, so states did not necessarily do this. So we think we have at least some rights to freedom of speech. Remember I told you that's not a blanket right? That did not come about until 1867. That's almost 100 years after the founding of the country. Civil War changed everything. It gave us the country we are. So, Washington is president. He was elected unanimously in the Electoral College, and he decided to call himself Mr. President, that that would be the first of many precedents. He's not your highness. He's not your excellency. He's not dude. He's Mr. President. By the way, what is a dude? What is the definition of a dude? No. It's actually mocking somebody. A dude is somebody from the city who wants to act like the vision of what a cowboy was in about 1900. They would go put chaps on the cowboy hat and act like a cowboy. That's a dude. So dude is actually was making fun of somebody. Dude. Okay, so with that, Mr. President, he never shook hands. He would only give a bow. He thought there should be a separation. The first president to shake hands, what do you want to guess? Biden. No president ever no. Thomas Jefferson. I imagine a politician not shaking hands. I will show you the politician's handshake. Go through it, learn it. It's very creepy. Okay. Oh, I almost forgot one thing. Washington, only president ever elected unanimously by the Electoral College. His vice president would be John Adams. I didn't write that down, John Adams. Next, he served two terms. Adams, vice president, two terms. And this would set the precedent. So anytime somebody would try to run for uh, two terms, Jefferson included, or think about it, they'd say, Washington only served two terms. He was exhausted after years of war and what he had gone through. He was also embittered by what happened, the political rancor. He was being called a traitor and pro-British by 1796, which seems so weird today. Also, he didn't actually write the bill, but it was his administration. He signed it. The Judiciary Act of 1789 created the court system. And we still basically have that court system today. Next, he created a cabinet. This, this uh, Constitution says there will be a cabinet. It says advise and consent by the Senate. So the Senate votes up and down, confirmation. I mentioned this before. And so he created this. He created the positions, copying the British. But one difference, the cabinet in Britain, they're all members of parliament. Cabinet in the United States, not members of uh, Congress. They have to resign their seat if they're a member. The State Department, he tried to pick people, a combination of loyalty, but also credibility. The Secretary of State went to Thomas Jefferson, the first position created. Originally, the State Department had internal and external functions. Today, write down State Department, that's foreign affairs, foreign affairs. Everybody else has a foreign ministry and a foreign minister. The United States, it's the State Department and Secretary of State. It doesn't make sense. It's copied after the Secretary of State in Britain that handles deals within Britain. But we're unique. Jefferson had the credibility, had been in Paris. He'd never been in any kind of real government except for a little bit as uh, colonial governor of Virginia. So he didn't have a lot of administrative tools. 
And immediately he would fight with the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson would join what most people believe about Hamilton. They thought he was evil. Hamilton, Jeff, now Washington shouldn't really trust him. Remember, he organized that Newburgh conspiracy to actually throw out, or to make Washington dictator. But Hamilton had great knowledge. Once again, it's unclear what the Treasury did. Hamilton would invent it. So get my people right. Hamilton, Jefferson, and this strange watercolor from an old textbook. The other departments, you don't need to know the name. Write down War and Attorney General. War and Attorney General. I didn't type them in there. War and Attorney General. Now, what are there? 18 departments. But then that was it. Postmaster General was also a cabinet level position all the way up until the 1970s. We're not going to worry about it. Uh, Knox, the guy who got the cannon from Ticonderoga to Boston and the governor of Virginia, Edmund Randolph. War Department, it's unclear. And they would decide a decade, or end of the decade, we need a Navy Department. They would be combined after World War II. And, so, and they would add something called the Air Force. And what do we call that today? What department? We're not a War Department, we have a Navy. What is it? I don't know. Homeland Security is everything outside of this. Someone maybe said I didn't hear it. I thought defense. Department of defense. They are in the biggest building in the world. What's the biggest building in the world? The Pentagon. Huh? Not uh, the biggest building. The Pentagon is massive, and then the Pentagon also goes down about seven stories. Of one of the building of the factory, that's of one open, one, one open area. That's the biggest. The Pentagon is many different. It's actually they're like, like five different layers of buildings. It's a complex building. So these are the main departments. And he also gave a farewell address. Every president would do it. Most of them are pretty unremarkable. Trump didn't really give a farewell address, so he's, he would not follow that precedent. But almost every president does. There are two farewell addresses we need to know. Of course, Jefferson's, and I mean, of course, Washington's, and we'll get to one more. We'll have to, we have to know in our class. That'll be Eisenhower in 1961. So the cabinet's brought together. They elected a new Congress. Madison was Speaker of the House. They had to create this country. And what kind of country will we be? And almost immediately, the idea of what kind of country will divide the elite running the country almost immediately. And it'll be around the very controversial, divisive attitudes of Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton, this will become known as Al Hamiltonian economics. He would write two pamphlets to lay it out. The report on credit and the report on manufacturers. And I didn't add this, put down, he greatly admired Britain. And so they copied Britain. This kind of little arrow for Britain, which is so interesting, isn't it? He spent his entire young life fighting the British, wounded in the war, and yet he wants to be like Britain. In a way, there's a picture of Hamilton. So uh, it blanked up class, but using the power of this brand new, powerful government, the central government should do everything in its power to help the financial elite, the merchant class. So help people with money. So basically, in an area where there's a finite amount of money, take money from working people and small farmers, the vast majority of people, and funnel it to the very tip top, the very wealthy. But the idea is they're smarter, they're better people. Remember this, people of a better sort. Funnel the money to them, yes. Is this also a trickle economics? Your, your jump, um, called trickle down, yeah. It, it, it exactly is. Yes. And, but this is pre capitalism. That's post capitalism. And what will they do with the money? They'll build manufacturing or finance. There's no banks, there's no real investment. I've meant to put stocks, I just put stock, stocks. And 
then also investment in bonds, create a financial system, finance, the buying and selling of money and investment, speculation. So take that money and build factories. They could also build a gold gilded toilet seat. You know, they can do whatever they want with their money. And then a large standing army, not just to defend the US territory against possible British attack, to take, to aggressively take the land here owned by other people, but also don't forget Shades' Rebellion. They, if it's another Shades' Rebellion, we have an army to put it down. And then working in these new manufacturing, do everything possible to get the vast majority of people in the United States get their wages as low as possible. Low wages. In fact, his goal would be to keep workers as destitute as possible. So desperate they'll take any wage and not comply. AKA Shades Rebellion. Make people so terrified that they can't feed their family they'll take any. Destitute. Did he announce this publicly? He brought it in the report on manufacturing yes. So he's gonna start rebellion on his own. Why do you think he has an army? Yeah, I mean with the army, that didn't sound I know. Well, I'm just but he planned on it. That was his plan. Now he it's obviously gonna be different down the road, and this is pre-capitalism. But this concept, especially oh, Low wages, but these two are very much an element of economics today. And so going into the end of the 19th century and the 20th century, they'll start dividing up economics of this, this capitalism as conservative and then by Franklin Roosevelt, liberal. Conservative economics or liberal economics? Is this conservative or liberal? The essence of conservative economics. In the 1920s, this would be called, as Chris said, trickle down economics. The goal to funnel money to the wealthy. So somebody, and people misuse these terms all the time, but if they truly do believe in conservative economics, they want to have you know, tax cuts for the very wealthy, most working people pay more taxes, push wages down, funnel money to the top. And so, like President Trump was inconsistent on a lot of things, but he's very conservative. His only real achievement legislatively, legislatively was massive tax cuts for the very long time. And so he was following this. Same thing with uh, Governor Jean Forte in Montana. Massive tax cuts for the wealthy, and most working people are going to, most people in Montana are going to actually higher taxes. But the very wealthy, especially people from out of state to come in, very wealthy from out of state, will get lower taxes. Why? Conservative I know this person because I'm going to pay. Uh, my taxes have gone two years in a row and they're, they're going to go up a lot next year. Most of your parents, their taxes are going to go up a lot next year. So that's conservative economics. Liberal economics we get to, that is still not really there yet. Hamilton is, has quite the foresight. So the first thing is due to the big divisive issue, hard to get a more divisive issue than this, would be the assumption of the debt, and I refer to it as the assumption bill. And it's also called the, or the assumption of debt and credit bill. So it's about credit. And what his plan was, let's pay out all colonial debt, state debts, even Continental Congress and Confederation Congress. All the debts, I didn't put the Confederation, but all the bonds, pay them back at 100% of the value. And remember, the speculators are scooping those bonds up at a penny on the dollar. So speculators are going to make sometimes a thousand, sometimes ten thousand percent profit. A lot of those speculators were at the Constitution Convention, and this is what they hope for. Hamilton is helping that speculators merchant class. And that's his goal. He wants to pump money in those hands. And remember, a lot of these people were like poor veterans who gave up willing to sacrifice everything for the new United States and got virtually nothing. So that's sucking the wealth out of them. These are the people who rebelled at Shades' Rebellion. So this is going against that rebellion and to funnel the money as fast as they can. 
literally. Suck it out of everybody and move it up. That's the plan. This is a very stylized picture of Hamilton proposing this to the new cabinet. The assumption bill. Why? Why did somebody pay off their debts? What is the reason people pay off the debts or make constant payments and don't miss payments? What is the reason people do that today? Yeah. The credit rating didn't exist yet, but they want good credit. Good credit. Now, a lot of people believe, I remember being told this by, uh, I had a professor at Waukee named Dr. Smalls. I like Dr. Smalls, but he was wrong. I remember, I could, it's not stuck in my head. He said, so the United States won't have a debt. We can pay off our debt always. That's not why people get good credit. Why do you get good credit? Because what do you want to do? Not just buy something, but you got to take about more money to buy something. You get good credit to borrow more. Hamilton didn't want to pay off the debt, so the U.S. had no debt. Hamilton wanted to pay off the debt to borrow more and more and more and more money. Pile debt on top of debt on top of debt, a.k.a. issue bonds like that. This is a newspaper to the right explaining this program. Borrow, 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 borrow. So the United States will have to pay back these bonds plus interest, 10, 20, 30. But if we have good credit, we have lower interest. So we don't have to pay back as much. He knew this. He wanted this. Now, there's a good logical reason to this. If people have money, you have to individually have money and you're not spending it. You know, you're burying it in jars in your backyard or whatever. It's not productive. If the government borrows that money and makes it, puts it to productive use, I'll disagree with that is, but puts that to productive use, that could expand the economy. That's a good investment. They could also do what Spain did at this time and spend all their money on war and move in, in the kingdom. So it could go up and down. And that's what he wanted. He wanted the government to prime the pump, borrow money and help. So give investment money to these merchants to build factories or build roads. There were no roads. How do you get goods to market? It's so expensive without roads. You think about it. If you have bad roads, you can't really, you can't really have wagons with a lot of goods on them. Or for that matter, I could add canals. And then the military. It's not just to put down rebellions. The military needs uniforms, weapons, cannon. Who's going to build them? And that would be more manufacturing. So. Now the merchant class, they're the ones who buy the bond. I'll spend the question mark in a second. Here is the thing. The very same merchant class speculator that he paid back at 100% of the value of the assumption bill, he wants to turn around and take that money back oh, uh, and have them buy bonds. The very same people he paid off, the speculators, he wants to borrow that money back. Here's that money. Now I'm going to borrow it back. Has everyone got that? The very same people. So basically using government tax revenues to give you money so I can borrow it back. And that means I'm going to borrow it back plus interest. So it's pretty expensive. Instead of just the government spending that tax revenue, he wants it like this. Why? So let's say you buy a bond. I'm stealing this. And this bond says you get $1,000 back in 20 years. 1811. Everyone got that? You want your money back, don't you? You want your money back in 1811. What has to be here in 1811 for that investor to get their money back? Not just the government, even though you're right, the United States. If there's no United States, that bond is worthless. What has he just done? He has bought their what? Those merchant class now would do whatever it takes to make sure the United States survives. He has bought their what? Compliance. Kind of, but even more, even more binding than that. Their loyalty. <laughs> Is that what you said? Good. Because think about it. They gotta now support the US government, meaning people like Hamilton. They want their money back. The only reason they bought those bonds is for an investment. I should add, what does Hamilton think about this merchant class? What are they loyal to? 
of England. He thinks they're actually awful people. You're a terrible person. How much money do you want? That's basically what he's saying. So with that, this is kind of diabolical, isn't it? Yeah. He was, but he was not wealthy. He really wanted to be. He was on the edge. He also knew, I can get stuff out of this. They owe me now. And they will invest in manufacturing and become the owners of factories or what we'll call in 50 years a capitalist. That didn't exist in the United States yet. It was only just beginning in Britain. He is incredibly farsighted and also diabolical, and you can see why Jefferson would call him evil. So that is going to become the position of the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party. That would be it. Of the Federalist Party. Where's the tax come from then? They got to tax somebody. Well, he doesn't want to tax wealthy people, does he? He wants them to have money. So they'll put a tax on a commodity that was incredibly important for small farmers, especially on the frontier. They're growing corn, maize. If there's no roads, it's really expensive to get maize to market. But what can you turn that maize into? Corn, because it's all sugar that is worth a lot of money. You mash it, get that sugar out. Whiskey. Whiskey comes from corn. A whiskey box. Small farmers were using this. There's no money on the frontier, so they're even using whiskey as money. And so they'll put an excise tax, which basically just means they have to pay on small farmers. You notice I put down small farmers. You notice I put down small farmers. The bigger the farm, the lower the tax. So he wants to see, he wants to really hit small farmers who don't really have any money anyways. Remember, they're in debt, they're on the margins. And he wanted to bankrupt the small producers. So the tax would be on the backs of the very poor. And that's what sales taxes are. Sales taxes hammer working people, but it's a big tax break for the very wealthy. Big tax. There's proposals for another sales tax by the current government in Montana. Montanans don't want it, but who knows? Maybe we'll vote for one. But that'll be a tax increase for most people. Another tax increase. So his goal was then to drive those small farmers out of business and create agricultural as a monopolies. Drive them out of business. I saw this head pop up like three times. Somebody must be below that jumping up. They're talking. Get off my hill. All right, so get rid of the small farmers. What? Exactly. Cheap labor for the factories. Isn't this diabolical? It's kind of amazing. So all these small farmers who thought, you know, they fought, they were the regulators in Shay's Rebellion and they, they fought for the Revolutionary War. And they're the ones put on the frontier. Yes, they're still in lab, but they're also the ones getting attacked. I mean, and they thought we finally made it and that's his plan. This is from an old textbook showing the happy version of the Hamiltonian plan. So he proposed this. The reaction to Jefferson and Madison, Furious is not strong enough. Madison is basically like, oh my God, what have I done? I wanted this strong central government, and now we've got it, and I'm not in charge. Hamilton is totally untrustworthy. Now, of course, they say the exact same things about Jefferson, but Rural farmers, what's going to happen is this. Rural farmers, what they said, is all their money are going to go to urban merchants. And that's 
Jefferson and Madison were rural farmers. They talked about small farmers, but they meant all farmers. So they're going to suck the money out of farms, suck the money out of rural states, and they're going to go pouring into Philadelphia and New York. And then Jefferson will turn around and say, Hamilton and his mercenaries. And mercenaries, so he's very anti-merchant class. What's a mercenary? What is their only loyalty when they fight? And that's what he's calling these investors. You're a bunch of mercenaries. I should add, there's an element of truth there. Why do you think so many large American corporations, I should say all American corporations, pay no end, pay hardly any taxes? Because they do a corporate headquarters in like Ireland or the Cayman Islands where there's no corporate income tax because they don't want to pay U.S. tax dollars. Because they're more loyal to the money than the United States. But they want all the benefits of the U.S. They want to live here. They want to have all the things in the U.S. Yeah. And as they saw, central government, by definition, is pro urban Large central government. And Madison wanted the central government. He's the father of the Constitution. And now we say, how dare we put the power in the hands of men like Hamilton? I should add later on to be saying, but it's okay when I'm in charge. I'm in school. And that's why they start saying the states need more power. And that would be the position of the brand new opposition party to the, to the Federalists, the Republicans. Now, in the textbook, you're going to see it written as the Democratic Republicans to differentiate them from future Republicans and future Democrats. But they call themselves Republicans. And this was their vision, the nice plantation. Yes, of course, plantation with slaves. A compromise would be met. John Adams, the vice president, would invite Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison to a dinner. Madison was Speaker of the House, and they invited him to this dinner. And the thing was, Adams, he sympathized with Hamilton, even though they despised each other. I should add, most people probably despise Adams. And virtually everyone despised Hamilton. But Hamilton knew what these two were. He knew they're from Virginia. They're rural Americans. They want a rural capital in Virginia. And that's what he promised them. I'll give you that rural capital. We'll call it the District of Columbia. Drop your opposition to the assumption that and that's what happened. The compromise, they got the capital, they dropped the opposition, and here's a cartoon mocking Jefferson for doing it. Here's Jefferson, and to get his capital, and that's kind of the vague Independence Hall, he's making a deal, AKA chasing, who's that? The devil. The deal with the devil. Thus, that is why we have District of Columbia, and they also knew a certain man was obsessed with a capital in Virginia, and they would name the capital city after him, Washington, because it was on the Potomac River, and that's where Washington's home is. Here's the Potomac, and it winds in here. Washington's home is right here. District of Columbia is right here. Originally, it was taken, it took part of Virginia and Maryland. Now it's only the Maryland side of the Potomac. There was not a city here. They created a city from scratch. And until Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s, Washington, D.C. felt subtle. And it felt like a small town. I mean, clearly, clearly, clearly if you go to Washington, D.C. now, it's a big town. They got, it, they got the rural capital, not in the financial centers of Philly and New York. This might be an issue having it right next to Virginia in case there's a, let's say a civil war. This might have problems with that. Yeah. So I always wonder why is there a Washington state and then Washington DC? Because one's name, they just want to name this after Washington. Mm -hmm. But there was still Washington DC. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of places that have cities called Washington. Lots of places. So the inevitable happened. 1794, the Whiskey Rebellion. Those small farmers angry at the tax rebelled. It was in Western Pennsylvania, it was mostly, and it was the same 
they formed regulators. There's a lot of cases, rebellion, they shut down debtors' courts, they kicked out judges. They even talked about making a brand new country called Westylvania. I know, darn it, that would have been awesome. Westylvania. But now we have a strong central government. Washington personally commanded a militia army of 12,000 men, bigger than the army he commanded at Yorktown, bigger than any army he commanded in the Revolutionary War. They're untrained militia, but they're still a militia with cannon and weapon bayonets. He put on his old Revolutionary War uniform and commanded it. This is a picture of him. Hamilton put on his old uniform and went in as his adjutant. They brutally put this down, arrested people without trial because it's an insurrection, held them, searched their homes without a warrant. The strong central government put down popular rebellion. That populist democratic movement was crushed. The Whiskey Rebellion was a big deal. Hamilton got what he wanted. Can you imagine today, or any, any president in your lifetime, the president leading on horseback the troops into battle? I can't imagine Biden, I can't imagine Trump, I can't imagine Obama, I can't imagine Bush. For me, you have to go all the way to President Grant. I can see Grant doing it. Who knows what Teddy Wilson But, and the Secretary of the Treasury, Jeanette Yellen, neither of them were the armed forces, but what the heck. All right, so. One last thing, really quick for today. The bus. The Bank of the United States was Part B. Hamilton, oh, I should add, we've had good credit ever since. The United States Treasury bills are the most secure investments in the world. But that's why in a month from now, when they start playing with shutting down the government, which has happened in one month, it could happen again. That's chipping away at America's reputation. That's really dangerous. So. Hamilton said, remember those elastic clause? He called implied power. It's implied because the government can print money, they can make a bank. Doesn't it make sense? You gotta have a bank. Doesn't say you can make a bank. So his proposal through his friends in Congress, a private bank, but who have a contract, AKA a charter for the first corporation. It's not quite what a corporation is gonna become, but the first one in American history a true corporation and this corporation will do three things tax revenues will go through this private bank but it's got a contract to do this they will issue currency here's a bank of the united states note handling the money supply they will loan money but the big thing is they'll loan money to create something that did not exist in the united states banks and once you have banks, that would promote industry. Business cannot function without credit. Pretty big thing. Jefferson and Madison now, more and more the Republican position went nuts. And the reason why is this. This would be owned, who owns a corporation? What do we call people who own a corporation? Hmm? CEO is called the chief executive officer. That's someone appointed by the biggest owners of a corporation to run the corporation. They don't own the corporation. Who owns corporations? They buy a piece of the corporation. What is that called? They're stockholders. Why does someone buy a stock in a corporation? What do they want? They want the portion of it. That would be the portion of that product. So they want the money, right? So they're getting people who want to buy stock for money. Got to get this last thing down. All right, so we got to get this last part down. And they're worried the stockholders will control the economy, this merchant class. And they will control the economy so they can make money. Could they manipulate the money supply to make money? Yep. Of course. All right, so we'll finish this tomorrow. I'm going to be gone on Thursday and Friday. The plan is to show Jefferson. Yeah, we'll show Jefferson. How many square feet? We need more than that. There's two more. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good lunch. Yeah. <laughs>
how about you find the opposite? You don't have to be here for now on. I want you to construct that out there. Out of ram rock. Yes. Yeah. 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 Stop. What about Apparently, the people are making runs there. No. And then. Devo. Did they destroy? I did the angel of the box and the white house and all the blocks. Yeah. That one. Yes. When is the Thursday? Or not anymore? Uh, it's the last video. Okay. Unless you really want to. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just let me be gone. I don't want to be here when I'm not good at the quiz. So you might just not have one. Sound good? Alright. See you Wednesday. I couldn't remember what day it was. Where were you yesterday? Why? The big city. Whirlwind trip. Well, we got this trip, so that's nice. Is it going for a family day or? Um, we went to the rent fair. The what fair? Rent fair. Oh, cool. How was it? It was awesome. It was a, it was a good combination of like uh, medieval themes, but also uh, spooky Halloween themes. <laughs> Where was it at? Um, when I used to have a village, I remember they used to have them at Pioneer Park. Yeah, I think that, that was it. Right by Building Senior? Yeah. No, that's a nice park. Boy was here. Um, Okay, we're not going to do the test today, but oh, I got to print that out.
Oh, I made a list of things for the task. It's going to be really basic. I mean, that's a look much like we did in human Westminster. So, yeah. It'll be like that. Just really mostly matching. A few things that provide a little bit more. And I know there's a lot of stuff on there, but I'm going to point you to try to get some stuff. If that's all. And so, I'm going to finish the last little bits and then. And then uh, review, and then gradually then start conspiracy today. I didn't quite finish. You know, stuff happens. change clause. But I'm letting you go over conspiracy theories. I have to go to physical therapy after, right? Literally right after class. Wow. Now old injury is gonna die. So I gotta got they work me out.
forgot something. You want a quiz, right? I do. Go ahead, do it. So you can write on this. Because I'm going to need extra copy. We'll just put the letters right next to the number. And it has some. Back it up. Back it up. Back it up, Bill. Too bad. 